Yeah, morning everybody. Thank you, Jacques, for the introduction. Welcome everybody. I see there's quite a few people in the room this morning. Uh, for those that uh, don't know me, my name's Steve Brown. I'm Operations Manager for the Institute of Plumbing. And uh, unfortunately, you have the me this morning and not the greats like uh, Richard, Dan Marius and Adrian. I think in terms of, of where we are, you'll see our topic today, non-compliance and refurbished buildings, and the key thing that have been passed, that they've actually passed inspections. So I think for me, it's just, uh, these were two sort of cases that we've had. As you know, I observe we received numerous complaints from members and non-members, or from individuals that um, have found problems in the building that's been completed, and then we basically called out to, uh, actually conduct an inspection or random inspection of various sort of uh, units or uh, uh, flats or whatever the case may be. So just this week I was with uh, Barry uh, Barry Chapman up in Belito and again a building that's just been completed uh, in the last sort of eight months, uh, 15 blockages that have occurred and then the individuals have done some repair work but then this is obviously after the fact we're, um, sorry, my screen's moving and jumping. Uh, I've got spooks in the system. But, um, you know, again, we're, uh, you know, continuous blockages and problems occurring. So, you know, going into the building and uh, with Barry and we go in and open up roof spaces and then we find some horrendous things that have been covered up. And then we then trace piping back and then find that um, the sewer has actually been cut, uh, plugged and then rerouted and then a different connection uh, formed in the street which has not been inspected or passed and it's this type of thing that we've got so on our next slide this was a, a block of flats that we were called into um, with regards to some amendments and changes that were done 140 odd units and we were basically called in to randomly have a look at these installations because there had been numerous blockages etc so my point in today's um, webinar is just explain to you in terms of, of where we are in terms of one the accountability in terms of the plumber two in terms of the professional team where the plumber is actually not um, bringing to the fore the non-compliance in terms of where the installation is and then basically how it ends up sorry guys my screen is jumping but um, it's just to show you the implications that now transpire from the plumber actually not asking or bringing to the attention of the professional team or the owners the consequences of the non-compliance. So in this one particular building, we randomly selected units to go and have a look and basically report on. So these are just randomly picked. They were not basically taken. So as we go through and we go through to the changes, very clearly under the bath, um, I'm seeing that my screen might be coming up. But basically under the bath, you can clearly see in terms of the, the way in which the bath traps have been fitted, you'll clearly see that there are no IEs installed and they're basically interconnected in terms of uh, the basins, et cetera, and the sinks. So again, if we go and have a look at the standards in terms of what Audrion's done over the last year in terms of um, you know bringing to the attention in terms of what SANS 10252 part two states clearly in terms of access, et cetera. Um, as we go through this presentation, you'll actually see that none of these items have actually been addressed and the consequences in terms of maintenance and repairs going forward is absolutely horrendous. One of the key things in terms of uh, the installation that we went to go and have a look at was obviously the positioning of the hot water cylinders. Now, bearing in mind buildings that are refurbished uh, may have had uh, a combination geysers installed and there's no allowance made for expansion reliefs or for teepees. And I think this is one of the biggest points that we have in terms of um, uh, new installations or refurbishments in terms of an existing building. So again, just in terms of where this is we go back and this thing is jumping again 
where we start looking at this positioning of the vacuum breakers. Now, again, you know, we're going to have a look at it at the point of, of um, commencement. All of these items should have been taken into consideration with regards to the expansion of leaves, positioning of vacuum breakers, heights of vacuum breakers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, <clears throat> again, 100 and something odd units complete, and then we start to see what you've got on your screen now. Vacuum breakers incorrectly positioned, and then we talk about the electrolysis. If you have a look at the pictures here, in terms of how these uh, copper pipes have been supported, and you'll start to see the corrosion that is basically coming through and how they've been secured. So again, consequences of, of the plumber or the professional team that were involved here, basically not ensuring that the dissimilar materials or the installations are done and carried out. In terms of this geyser installation, just waiting for it to change, you'll clearly see in terms of the vacuum breakers where they're not positioned correctly. You'll also note that the TP, in terms of the arrows, you'll start to see that there's 90 degree bends put on it. And I don't know why this is jumping, but let's just go back to that. So then you'll start to see all of these different things and you'll see the dissimilar materials and how these have actually been taken out into the building. So again, it starts from the design. And again, the plumber not asking the question, and I think this is one of the key components that we've spoken about from both Richard's side and my side and everybody else that does the presentations, is that we need to ensure that uh, we ask the right questions. If you look in the service duct, you'll start to see right at the bottom the IEs. Uh, again, how you get to these toilet pans and these waste pipes through those, those fittings, uh, access is key. Um, Adrian has on numerous occasions spoken about uh, access and what the standards require in terms of access to the waste piping, etc. These basically, it's two bathrooms back to back, and again, all coming into one common line. And the access to the pans, you literally have to remove the pans in terms of getting access to the drain. You are not going to clear it from there. You also note there's some polycarb pipe there. That was they had uh, uh, prepaid water meters in there that have been removed. There were some issues with them. But again, you know, the similar materials in terms of what has been utilized on this installation. This uh, particular block has been flooded on more than one occasion and various things. And again, as we look at underneath the, the sinks, obviously they've used the spazios. And uh, again, in terms of access and open areas, in terms of, of flooding, uh, these have been left open basically for the uh, washing machine connections or dishwashers or whatever the case may be. But uh, um, this, as we go back and change now, is a horizontal line that's basically built into the brickwork. And there was obviously blockages. And this is what has transpired in terms of trying to rectify this installation. Like I've been constantly saying and Ariane is saying, access to these positions of piping and, and, and IEs, et cetera, is critical to the installation or the maintenance of a plumbing system. This you'll see the brickworks had to be chopped out horizontally. You'll actually see that there's got backfalls on it, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is just one of numerous uh, uh, units that have the same problem. And again, if you start looking at the cost, this is face brick that, that's on the outside. It's basically on the passage. And this is what's had to transpire in terms of trying to get access to the actual pipe work. So this is not about you know fear and having a laugh and how bad things are. For me, the critical thing here is that at no stage did the plumber actually bring to the attention to anybody of the challenges with regards to the actual installation or access to all of these particular uh, waste, water, uh, piping, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If you have a look in here, now you'll see that white uh, paint that's on there. It's actually fireproofing uh, for the actual service ducts themselves. So in this, you'll see a multitude of sins. Now there's been a blockage there, so you'll see that the guys have chopped open to get access to underside of the bath, uh, which is now taken away from the fire coating. You'll also see the same two IEs at the bottom and how you're supposed to clear a pan in terms of that. But the biggest one is where the arrow is. You'll see where that arrow shows. That's the TP discharge from the geyser, which has been blocked. So this is our first one that we checked. And you'll clearly see that potential 
uh, uh, well, not potential. We just, in terms of what the guys have done, they've created a bomb. This again is the TP discharge. There's a total of four 90 degree elbows that's been utilized on this discharge pipe. And you'll also note that it's caused a trap at the bottom and uh, the distance in terms of where it discharges and also blocked. So again, the question with regards to the discharge from that TP has not been brought to the attention of uh, the professional team and the plumber has not raised it. So if you can imagine in terms of these units that we've checked, uh, you'll see further photos that have basically come through. But again, <clears throat> this is just a, a total either lack of understanding of the standards or for that matter, um, the professional team in terms of it. Here you'll see another unit and you'll see again, that the fireproofing that's been uh, painted to protect and stop the fire from spreading. You'll see that that's been chopped out from underneath the bath. So that's been taken uh, out. And you'll again see where the removal of the prepaid water meters have been done to similar materials in terms of, of the wastewater, the piping not supported, and again, the IEs for access to the toilet pans, etc., etc. So clearly non-compliant. Then we have the same type of thing again, where uh, again, as you'll see in every one of these, where there's been a problem, it's basically been chopped open because there's no access panels to get underneath the bath, which is a requirement. You can't get access to the wastewater line. And you'll see in terms of this one, we've got two 45s and then one IE. Now, again, trying to clear a toilet pan or uh, any blockages there in terms of the wastewater from the bars of the basins, etc. It's just absolutely impossible. Here we have the overflows now in in Durban, you basically, in terms of the municipal regulations or bylaws, they're very clear in terms of overflows must uh, discharge externally. And you can clearly see that, yes, this was discharging externally, but somebody's come along and decided, no, nope, it's easier to just bash it, plug it, and uh, create an additional problem. Here we have another one, again you'll see, broken underneath the bath, and to the right you'll see there that the TP has been painted over and plugged with the fire protection coating. No access underneath the bath, you clearly see there's no IEs, that uh, waste fittings are actually uh, interconnected, and obviously in terms of four, there's minimum four in terms of the discharge from the basins, etc. <clears throat> another view of another unit where, again, you can clearly see that the TP discharge has been plugged, again, creating a bomb. And bearing in mind, guys, when Mahen and I, Mahen being one of our uh, auditors here, um, when we went through, these were only six of like a hundred and something odd uh, units that have been done. One of the key components was not even one COC was, was issued for the geese installations on this particular unit. Here, TP plugged. Another one that we opened up, as you'll see, 90 degree bends have been utilized on this. They're all basically the same in terms of trying to get it out. And then you have this one being partially plugged. So again, it doesn't look like the pirate or the fire coating guy got to this one, but basically you can see the cement and the restriction in terms of the TP discharge pipe. In terms of this service duct, when we opened it, uh, there are shops below and uh, this water has been leaking through into the shops, bearing in mind this is a newly renovated building and uh, all of this water discharging and leaking down into the units below. In terms of this installation, um, you'll clearly see that the TP on the right and, and to the left, not blocked until you close the door. 
So when you close the door, the actual door seals the teepee. So we've got a door that now comes flush up to the uh, TP discharge pipe, bearing in mind it's also got the 90 degree bends, et cetera, et cetera. So again, not necessarily plugged, but because of the door and the positioning of those pipes, uh, when the door is sealed and closed, it basically seals the, uh, the TP and in essence plugs the TP. So going back to, to where I was talking about, and this is, this is again, just going back to the consequences that now come out of this. If we look at this installation and we take this as being six units that we've actually had a, a look at, and uh, those that, that we haven't, I mean, the potential for lawsuits, the potential for damages, et cetera, et cetera, is huge. To have this passed, in terms of um, the professional team or those individuals in terms of that design is questionable. The plumber in terms of, of his reporting, remember guys, it's, it's, it's you are the professional, you are the individual that um, takes responsibility for this installation. You are the one that actually has the voice to say, I can't do this, it's non-compliant because at the end of the day, it's gonna come back to the plumber. You were the professional, you were the one that actually did this installation, you were the one that did not bring it to our attention in terms of this non-compliance, or basically telling us the risk, not only to people or person, uh, or person or property, but again, we have a challenge here where without all of this info that's there, there's no paper trail in terms of protecting the actual plumber uh, and him being the professional. So my, my, my basically my, my just for, for today's webinar is just to go back to the reality of the fact that we do have the right to actually question any design. And again, questioning it in terms of what the standards say. All too often we hear aesthetics over compliance. We have that on numerous occasions with, with architects, et cetera, where they don't want to see a pipe. But the reality of the fact is that that pipe has to be there. It has to discharge and nobody can tell you to break the law. You know, you have rights as a plumber. Uh, all too often I see in terms of this type of thing where um, we are, or people are making decisions for people that are going to be buying these units or, or moving into these units and decisions are made on their behalf by individuals that have either don't want to spend too much money or additional money in terms of bringing buildings into compliance. And all too often, when I get involved with these, and as does Richard and, and, and Stephen Sale and the guys, when we go out to site, that decision and right's been taken away from the plumber because he actually hasn't voiced his opinion. He actually hasn't voiced, not his opinion, but what the standards require in terms of uh, plumbing installations. So, you know, this is not something that we make up. You know, some guys turn around and say, you can make this up, but truly, um, the, this is a reality more and more on a daily basis where our ops is involved and we, we get involved whether it be from the, the plumber or the consumer and for members and for non-members. So we as our ops are, will go in and do these inspections and reports and uh, bring it to their attention. So if you can imagine if we just take this building for example, what that cost would be in terms of trying to rectify these things. And it shouldn't be the case if the plumber had actually raised these points of concern uh, from the get-go. So I'm just trying to explain to you guys this morning is just that we do have the right to question. And if you don't have the answers, then certainly go to your local chairman, go to uh, uh, IOPSA, speak to Steve, myself, whatever. But there's a wealth of information out there to support you in terms of uh, installations that are non-compliant and uh, it's our duty as professional plumbers to bring it to the attention of the consumer owner user in terms of the risks that apply to these particular types of installations. So Jacques in terms of mine it's just a quick one we on time with 20 minutes I think Adrian would be quite proud of me that I've actually got to 20 minutes and um, if we have any questions we can kick off. Uh, yes, Steve, we have quite a few questions. Uh, the first one, if the plumber mentioned it, it, it's on his non-compliance and the owner was informed, what is the next no. step? Sorry. Yeah, there was no non-compliance uh, issued. And as I said to you, in terms of the installation, there was no non-compliance certificates or certificates of compliance issued on this job. 
Uh, this came through from numerous complaints and everything else and floods in this particular area that we were requested to come and do it. So there was no non-compliance and no certificates of compliance issued. All right. Um, the second part of the question is, what is the next step if there was a non-compliance filled in? Look, if there was a non-compliance you know, certificate issued, okay, bearing in mind this would be considered a new bill because this was a start to finish, complete new. So therefore, there shouldn't be any non-compliance items. Okay, then the next one, what is the process to couch these licensed plumbers if they did wrong and COCED? Okay, so in essence, what happens is, again, uh, you know, we do have individuals that don't issue COCs. So let's try and look at the reason for that. If you don't issue a certificate of compliance, it obviously doesn't go into the system. So therefore, you really aren't going to be audited, okay, unless there are complaints that come through. And then through that and through the due process of the complaints procedures through PIRBI OPSA, then we will take it up. So the first thing we would ask, as we did in terms of this installation, is was a certificate of compliance issued? And then we would take it from there. Once we've been to site um, and we've established who the plumber is, we would then start the process of asking the question of the plumber, how is it that this was done? And we would start to take the challenges. This report that we would submit would go to the owner that they can use basically for any legal uh, 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 processes and procedures that they want to put in place. Okay, the next one. Is the access door a requirement on a bathtub with wall mounted mixer and mixer and trap on the middle? Okay, in terms of, and I think Adrian, one of the guys has covered it, that you are required to have access to get underneath the bath. It is a requirement uh, in terms of getting access to the traps, et cetera, et cetera. So if you look at this particular thing that we've looked at today, there is no access. So you've actually got to break the, 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 the duct in order to get underneath the bath. And if you look at the fire coating that's put there, that's basically put there to stop fires from spreading up through the service ducts. And again, you've taken away from the integrity of the building and the safety by the virtue of the fact that you've had to chop this open. And then nobody's going back to actually patch or do whatever in terms of making that building safe again. Okay, and the next one, when auditing a geyser installation of an old building and the geyser is in the cupboard, it cannot be piped out of the building due to design. I am not failing, but making a note about the issue. Is that correct? Okay, 100%. Uh, well done to the individual that sent that question in. I think we've got to remember, and I have done a couple of webinars where, um, you know, you are going to get those in terms of um, installations and high-rise buildings, factories, and positions where you can't make it compliant. So the key component is to, one, go back and make sure that it's safe. I think that's one of the key things that we actually look at is in terms of safety. So, and that you are obliged to bring it to the attention of the homeowner user in terms of what is non-compliant. But to walk away from it and leave a TP discharge uh, above a bath or a shower or whatever, knowing the risk, um, yeah, you need to ensure that you've made that installation safe. And if it discharges above a shower and you've just said, well, that's where it is, then there certainly is a problem because that cannot be there. and It cannot discharge where it's going to cause uh, uh, damage to uh, personal property. So just be very careful in terms of what it is. We cannot walk away from an installation um, and just say, well, it is what it is. We need to make sure that if it can't be compliant, then we need to look at the safety aspect of that. But good question. Well done. Next one, what is the access requirement for a freestanding bath? Oh, under correction, I think it's 300 by 300 in terms of, of that. I'm, I might be wrong, but um, yeah, if they put that question through, we will certainly um, uh, send those details through to the individual that's asked that question. But I think under correction, 300 by 300 uh, in terms of the access. Old buildings, we used to have the air bricks outside that you could remove those and get the access underneath the bath. But it's critical in terms of getting to uh, water piping, to traps, uh, to the overflows, to Nikki spouts, etc. So it's quite critical in terms of getting to that. Bearing in mind any damage to property, if you have a look at these, uh, you're either removing tiles, you can't match the tiles, or it's face brick. So far easier. Uh, some of the panels that I've done, it's just basically a 300 behind by 300 frame. Bit of masonite using the existing tiles with mirror screws fixed and done. So, and it looks aesthetically uh, appealing. 
And then there's also other covers that come through in terms of stainless steel that you can actually have uh, purchased in place. The next one, I think it runs on the previous one, the bath type with the skirt that the trap, etc., cannot be seen. Yeah, if you're talking about those those corner baths and everything else where you can remove that 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 skirt, I mean, they do come off. I mean, they are certainly a challenge. Uh, don't break one. I have, and you can't buy one without the other. So again, where that skirt is, and you can get it access uh, access to it, hundred percent. But for me, I've cracked two and ended up having to buy two corner bars for the simple reason that, uh, yeah, I was a little bit too strong for it or I kicked it and cracked it. So one of the two, so just be careful. But if there is access, you can remove and get in 100%. Okay, the next one is quite a long one. Uh, we can all see that the plumbers did not do his uh, the plumbers did not do his job correctly, but we can see that he attempted to solve a lot of challenges. Is the original is the original sin not the architect that tried to keep his client happy with a renovation design that was near impossible to do in the building provided? When are the architects going to be educated and taken to task? Okay, 100%. Okay, but the key thing here is there's no paper trail of the individual actually bringing this to the attention of the architect. So let's go back to what I said earlier. The plumber has been challenged in terms of design. You go and have a look and see. I think Adrian did uh, a tech talk on, on, on what a service duct is required to have. Um, so there's numerous things in terms of the standards, in terms of the size of the ducts and the designs. So as a responsible plumber, when you got those plans, the first thing that you would look at is going, okay, hold on, you know, where does the TP discharge? How does it discharge? If you have a look at this design, it, there could have been a design uh, done within the cupboards. They're all one above the other. There could have been additional piping installed to take the expansion relief. Um, they could have been there to take the, the trays. I mean, because these trays that are below these geysers, are actually going into a trap. Now, when you go into the units, it just there's just a total smell coming through because there's inconsistent flow of water to keep the trap uh, wet. And so therefore, you have other challenges in terms of, of that. So yes, you can see the plumber has tried, but really, did he actually go about it the right way? And that's why my emphasis in terms of this is the paper trail in terms of bringing it to the attention of the professional team. Understanding that architects are not plumbers, they look at aesthetics, okay? They look at how does this look rather than can it comply? Adrian's raised this, uh, Richard's done it, um, Marius has done it. So I think the key thing for us is to bring it to the attention of the individual. Um, so yes, that's what we need to do as the responsible plumber. But at the same time, what is IOPS and PIRB doing it? We're constantly working uh, with the architects. Next year, we're basically doing, uh, speaking to Brendan the other day, where we're actually going to start putting training out to the architects to bring them to the, uh, the point of where they actually under need to understand what the requirements are in terms of plumbing. Because this net effect on terms of this installation, it's great now. But from a maintenance point of view going forward, and the, and the standards are very clear in terms of what is required in terms of maintenance, in terms of access, um, that certainly hasn't been done here. So therefore, the cost to the consumer, uh, that aesthetics that they're talking about is now gone because you're breaking brickwork, you're breaking tiles, you're breaking uh, 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 everything to try and get to fix a problem. So yes, we are working on it. Um, certainly it's a challenge, but not something that I don't believe that we can actually overcome. Okay, unfortunately, that is all that we have time for this morning. The questions that were not answered will be answered via email. Uh, thank you guys for joining us and thank you, Steve. Yeah, I think, uh, Jacques, thanks very much. Just in closing, I just want to thank uh, uh, Articulated. I won't be back online this year because we've got quite a busy program. But two things that I just want to bring to the attention is thank you very much to the presenters. I don't think that you guys in attendance today actually realize how much work goes into to this, to Jacques, to Sean, uh, putting this together, to Cindy, you know, the team that actually works to, to bring this to you guys every Thursday. Uh, I just want to say thank you very much to the presenters in terms of the time that they, they put uh, together in terms of these presentations. Um, one of the key things for next year, uh, just giving you the, the heads up, uh, we'll be looking at business webinars, very key in terms of on Monday, where we're going to start looking at the business uh, aspects of, of plumbing, how to run a business, et cetera, et cetera. So look forward to those. Uh, to Cindy for keeping everything together on articulated side, brilliant. And um, yeah, as I won't be chatting to you guys, have a, 
a great Christmas. It's amazing. Tomorrow is November. I hope that you guys have enjoyed the uh, the series so far this year. I think it's great when we start to see the attendance numbers. But um, thank you to all. Take care and have a great day. Thank you, Steve. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us for this morning's Tech Talk. As I said, the questions that were not answered will be answered during the e uh, via email. Do take a few seconds on your way out to fill in the survey for us. And then enjoy the rest of your day and happy plumbing.